if you look at any object that is sufficiently valued, if you look at any um, celebrity or politician or um, movie or a business or platform or a sellable good, the reason why value connotes to that thing terminally is because it started with some attention generating event that was able to provide value flows to that product or service or object or company or celebrity or whatever it may be. And positioned correctly, the same thing could happen with digital objects. Welcome to the Squiggle Dow podcast. My name is Jared and online you can find me on Twitter as Jared underscore pause. I am the founder of the 8NAP Digital Asset Fund, the generative art platform 8NAP Art, and I am a diehard enthusiast of the Chromie Squiggle. And I'm Nifty, Elite Finance, Acquisitions and NFTD Fight for the DAO, and I'm also another huge fan of Squiggles. Our guest today is Derek Edwards. Derek is managing partner at, at Collab Currency, a crypto-focused venture fund. Also, he's the founding member of Flamingo, an advisor to proof, a member of the Artblocks Curation Board, and the co-founder of Glitch Marfa. It's an honor to have him with us today. Derek, welcome to the pod. Thank you, guys. I'm excited to be here. Uh, you guys are, are two of my favorite follows, and I'm excited to dig in and, and chat some of the, uh, the internet rainbow lines that we all love. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we've done a lot of research for the episode, and one of the sources is saying that you are some kind of chess prodigy, chess mm. champion. What's the story behind that? The story is... Um, I went to private school in uh, Los Angeles growing up at a very early age, and we had a science teacher, uh, his name was uh, Bill Serlo, uh, who was a, a, a very avid chess player. And he essentially, um, in his free time, created a chess program uh, that anybody could participate in at a very early age. I think it opened up to kindergartners. Uh, so I started playing chess uh, pretty actively around the first grade, um, and proceeded to just like fall in love with, with the game. And, uh, myself and, uh, my two brothers, we played competitively for about 10 years. Um, I won a couple of state championships in California. I won a national blitz championship at one point, uh, in middle school and, uh, competed, I think in, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of competitions and, uh, in chess and uh, was a nationally ranked player for a time. Uh, so that's the that's the story. I don't play competitively anymore and haven't for a very long time, but I'm known to pick up a game here and there and, and play casually with folks. Note to self, don't put money on a chess game with Derek. That's insane. <laughs> that's really cool. I mean, that's that's really indicative of, I think, that maybe the way you think in general. I know chess, full disclosure, I'm no good at it, but you're you're always thinking many steps ahead. You've always seemed to, at least in this space and throughout your career, be a step a, or two ahead of most people. Uh, can you explain like your journey into crypto, kind of segueing off of that, that chess approach? Because I think that there's a, there's a strong correlation here. Yeah. So uh, pre-crypto, I'll just give a, a quick background on myself. Um, went to business school, went to law school, passed the bar exam, um, did them uh, both at the same time. And so after I passed the bar that summer, I uh, decided I didn't want to practice law. I uh, turned down a couple of gigs in, in Oregon and California to start a consumer startup company with a few of my business school classmates. Uh, we grew that up, um, built it into a national brand. Uh, in 2017, I decided uh, to kind of merge that company with a much larger company in our industry and started to take my foot off the pedal a bit on that business as I started to look for kind of next things. I uh, had a buddy who had just uh, walked away from his own startup company that was starting to explore digital assets. This was very late 2016, early 2017. And later that year, I spent quite a bit of time with him trying to understand exactly what it was that was exciting to him. Um, ended up in early 2018 writing some pieces about crypto assets and its intersection with regulated uh, forces. Um, I started advising a couple teams in New York and Los Angeles, and then eventually ran a think tank for a few years uh, that was really focused on that intersection. Um, I think we're starting to see a resurgence in that intersection around RWAs and real world assets. But at the time, there was a lot of red tape and regulatory friction towards making that industry blossom. Um, and yeah, I would say like that, that, um, 
that initial kind of ICO craze and trying to understand the temperature of regulation around what was happening was probably the first time I came into this space with, um, with enough force and velocity to stick around. You were one of the first movers when Flamingo was a spun off from the Lao and wanted to know what was your rationale at the time, which was super early to invest in NFTs and to understand your thinking. Yeah. So at that point, I was already investing uh, professionally. So a little bit about my fund. We're on our third fund, um, our, our company that I run with, uh, with my partner, Steve. Uh, it's called Collab Currency. We spun out of a much larger fund, or at the time, much larger, called Collaborative Fund. It's a traditional venture shop based in San Francisco, New York. Um, they were investing out of the main fund. We eventually spun out uh, our group just to focus on crypto. And so by 2020, I mean, we had done uh, a ton of investments, I would say, in DeFi and in infrastructure and um, just crypto assets broadly. We were at the time, you know, uh, and continue to be large holders of things like Ethereum and Bitcoin and uh, Solana and DeFi protocols and picks and shovels infrastructure projects uh, like, you know, uh, Bison Trails, which sold to Coinbase uh, and, and things like this. We got pitched a project in early 2020 called Super Rare. Uh, and Super Rare was the first time that I really started to understand the power of the ERC-721. And we did that deal, that seed round for Super Rare, along with one confirmation. And I just fell in love with the rapper. I thought, you know, if uh, today it's crypto art, but in the future, it's going to be all sorts of property that's baked into this rapper. Um, and so I would say the... The mental models I started to form really came about as a result of writing a, pay, a piece announcing our investment in Super Rare. It's called You're Sleeping on Crypto Art. I worked on it that summer and published it, I think, towards the end of summer, um, where I made the argument that you could replicate the contemporary art market on chain using smart contracts and blockchains and digital objects that were wrapped around this scarcity wrapper. Um, and from there, I just went on a total hunt to find and figure out all the different ways that uh, NFTs could be leveraged by businesses, by artists, by creatives, uh, by platforms, by games. Uh, and that was the thing I think that kickstarted my interest in this in uh, with NFTs specifically. That's super interesting to hear. And, and great piece, by the way, if someone in the audience hasn't read it, go ahead because that's a great one. Um, you were in Collab Currency, you were one of the first investors in NFTFi, the, the NFT lending platform that was raising money when NFT DeFi was not even a thing. And, and how do you spot these trends so early? And, and again, what's your thinking to analyze those trends at that time? Yeah, so I'd say there's two pieces. The first is... Um, I'm an experimenter by nature. So like I'm constantly trying things out and wasting all sorts of money playing around with new protocols, new platforms, new assets, just trying to, to for frankly, my own understanding of how this technology is shaping the innovations that are happening at the edges. It really helps for me concretely articulate where I think the technology is going just by virtue of like participating on the bleeding edge. And I would say the second thing is um, I really try and like write down frameworks and mental models. Like I've done this throughout my career. And what that does is it forces me to start thinking about how things will actually evolve in the second and third order effects of those things evolving. So the question you're asking is like NIFT, uh, NIFTify, NFTFi, um, which essentially for folks that don't know is collateralized lending for NFTs. Uh, it's a very simple product, but at the time when we did I think the pre-seed round in 2020, there was a couple of assumptions that were true that needed to be true for a product like this to exist and become big. The first was that NFTs um, would be a thing, right? Like the Niftify product, collateralized lending for NFTs doesn't really work if NFTs aren't an elegant wrapper by which to put around a digital object, uh, which frankly wasn't a, like a mainstream view at that point. Um, the second thing was, even if that was true, that Peer-to-peer -peer collateralized lending would be the optimal way by which, you know, to take out a loan against an object. And then the third was that digital objects could be so valuable or certain digital objects could be so valuable to warrant uh, markets actually forming around lending around these things. So I guess, you know, like two or three different assumptions that needed to be true for a product like that to exist. 
Now, none of those three things were mainstream views by any stretch of the imagination. But if you drew the line out from the argument that you could replicate the contemporary art market using blockchains and ERC-721s and smart contracts, that, you know, eventually markets would form around certain classes of objects such that they would start to replicate some of the market forces and the economies that are built around objects in the contemporary art market, some of which go for hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, there's a huge, you know, array of, of objects that, you know, are valued, uh, you know, over, you know, one to $5 million in our contemporary in like that trade actively. Uh, there's artists, there's objects, there's themes, there's, um, you know, all, all sorts of market forces that are informing how things are valued just in, in art itself, that even taking 1% or 5% of that value and having it absorbed in trust minimized technology, I could wrap my head around how collateralized lending for NFTs could get big. And so I guess like it, it, to answer your question directly, it's really a function of like really getting my ideas crystallized and starting to draw out second, third order effects of those ideas as time progresses, uh, that leads to some of like these very early conviction bets and categories. Very eloquently put. I, I love listening to you break down these very complex things into to, into very logical paths. Uh, when it comes to like that traditional, I know you kind of have, or I, I, we've heard that you have a, a leg in some traditional art. And I guess my question becomes, like, how important is it that the squiggle be recognized as, you know, something dynamic. And I ask that because you've always been a big fan of it. You've put it into the Holy Trinity digitally. Um, and like, what does that represent for closing the gap between the, the two entities at this point or the two verticals, right? Like we have two almost siloed, the traditional art, the digital art. Like what, what does that bridge look like? Cause I know you're, I mean, you're pioneering and a big supporter of like the, the squiggle sweater and, and really the the digital fashion. Like it, it makes so much sense to me that there is that logical, like what does that bridge look like to you and, and what is the squiggles role? Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. The, the first thing I'll say is I think there's lots of destinies for something like the Chromie squiggle project. Uh, and Malta and I wrote a uh, co-wrote a piece about the squiggle this month that everyone should check out if they get a chance. Um, but I think the, the first and foremost, um, you know, the, the, pro the technical innovation that Snowfro created using the Chrome Squiggle as the first vehicle and then the Artbox platform as a networked platform by which other artists to enjoy that same technological innovation, the, it's difficult to evaluate the Chrome Squiggle without starting there. And like the importance that that innovation has had on our space and will continue to have on generative on-chain media over time. Um, so from just a, a historical innovation perspective it's um it's very clear to me that like as we go through time we're, we'll be able to point back to this holy trinity of projects that really recognized step functions and how this movement came about how it was appreciated and how standards were set that informed its natural evolution over time and you 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 call it the holy trinity i've mentioned this before those three projects to me are CryptoPunks, autoglyphs and chromie squiggle each one of those set a new standard by which the, the, the next would build on to really set in motion what I would consider to be one of the big and most important movements of our time, which is on-chain generative art. The logical path for where those things go, I think because, uh, and this is where my appreciation of the squiggle is pretty expansive, it's clear that there is a historical art context by which to view the chromie squiggle. Um, it is a symbol, it is an instructional guide, it is a, a project on its own merits that shows um, all of, I think, the, um, the interesting components of what make long-form generative art interesting all packaged neatly into like a single identifiable um, piece and collection. But it also is on its own merits, like a very accessible and friendly and colorful project and can be evaluated under a non-traditional contemporary art lens as well which is what excites me about when I see what you guys are doing around the squiggle signature, or I see projects that are like 90 CCs, uh, ITO2 or tribute brands, um, odds project, taking the on-chain algorithm and repurposing it for a new direction, whether it's digital fashion or immersive environments, uh, or everyday signifiers or identity marks. Um, I think what we'll find is 
there is a cultural component to this collection that I think lends itself to getting quite interesting as time progresses, given how versatile and interesting it is. Yeah, I mean, you're clearly seeing a community rally around the, the Chromie Squiggle. I mean, it, it and Eric, you know, which we'll get into in a little bit. But in, in the same vein of that bridge, you've, you know, one of the things that I've come to really enjoy about the space is Marfa. And you've chosen to, you know, put a, an art gallery there where there's this physical representation. And Nifty's called it out a couple of times. I fell in love with Matt Delorier's folio as a result of seeing it mm. in your English Marfa because there's something to be said about the, the emotional connection. So uh, what motivated you to open that? Is, is that in vain of the, the same physical that we're talking about? Yeah, so uh, definitely a couple of pieces coming together on that one. The first is, for the first ever Art Blocks weekend, this would have been two years ago, I believe, um, Flamingo Dow actually rented a big house, and we all spent, um, I think, three or four days out there together, just taking in Marfa and spending time with the Art Blocks team and the early Art Blocks community that was forming around the platform. And we had a blast. And while we were there, my business partner and I, so Steve, uh, who I mentioned previously, thought it would be like a really interesting idea to start looking at real estate and as a place to kind of invest some of our own resources into. Um, what originally started as a possible residential prop property, like where we would just go and stay and spend more time in Marfa and maybe figure out ways to engage with the community. After I chatted with Eric, uh, he put me in touch with his realtor and uh, it, the play then became maybe a commercial property. So we started looking at those. And then finally, I came across this plot um, it, that had this, uh, uh, you know, a New York, uh, New York attorney had come and worked with an architect to build out a gallery in the front, a commercial kitchen in the middle, and a residence in the back. And the more I spent time with this property, the more I realized, uh, given the, its location, it's right there in the middle of town, given some of like the properties of the space itself, um, I thought it could be a very interesting space for us to invest in and start teasing out some of this interaction that uh, we had been talking about. Um, Eric has like been a proponent of, which is this intersection of digital and physical, uh, and um, some of like that surface area that could help bring people into the space uh, from a physical first component. And so I sat down with my business partner Steve. We mapped it out and decided to just pull the trigger. And so. Um, we bought it and have been investing and, um, working on it ever since we ran our first, I mean, we've been running exhibitions all year long. Uh, we've been doing stuff for the town of Marfa. We've done some digital art stuff. Uh, Madison who runs the gallery day to day, uh, has gone out there a bunch of times to put on, um, exhibitions in support of other events that are happening in Marfa. But our first big, I would say weekend was last year's art blocks weekend where I think we had maybe about a dozen different sessions over the course of three days, uh, many of which are you know my portfolio companies that I work with, uh, many art box artists, many creatives. Uh, I think we did a hundred proof podcast live uh, one morning, and really tried to act as a conduit for the town of Marfa and folks that were so excited about the digital stuff that were happening here to be in a physical space in participation with one another. And that compounding energy could help bring excitement to uh, everything that we're doing here, regardless of what path you're entering this space into. And so that's really been the, the mission of Glitch. It's really to um, be a, a spearhead for this intersection of digital and physical and um, storytell that intersection and get people really activated around all of the exciting stuff that we, the three of us, people in SquiggleDAO, collectors of crypto art spend time thinking about all the time. Um, even if you don't have like that, um, requisite knowledge set. And so like providing a pathway for people to be able to experience that through this physical, the, this physical space. Uh, so, the, and, and it's also what has informed our first product every 30 days. Which is amazing. I was about to yeah. say, if you haven't checked it out and you're listening to this, the, the every 30 days is amazing. Um, the, and to your point about what you wrote and penned, it's, uh, you do an incredible job highlighting projects, their importance, and uh, giving it not only the the digital but the physical space. Uh, very attractive price point for entries on these posters. I mean, you're doing a lot of really amazing stuff. Anybody who's not already 
drawn to to you just listening with the as far as we are in now i mean check it out there, there's some really really amazing stuff being put yeah on. i can give like just a quick uh if that's helpful just like a quick summer on every 30 days um so uh so with glitch uh we ended up kind of splitting it up into two efforts uh there's other side which hosts programs and events and um and so it's got like a bar and a restaurant on this the back half of of what is now like the glitch building. And then the front half is the gallery. And on the gallery side, uh, myself, uh, Madison, our gallery director and Malta from bright moments, uh, the three of us have, have really focused our time and energy into building out that front facing effort. Um, and as I mentioned, every 30 days is the first product. And the, the concept there is to really funnel interest into a single object by a single artist every 30 days and story tell that physically and digitally. And so how that works is uh, we've, we now work with a bunch of really great partners. We work with Danvis on our screen display. We work with Transient Labs on the contract. Uh, we work with um, an amazing designer. Uh, we've worked with two amazing designers. One was Carolina De Bartolo from Artblocks, and now it's uh, a gentleman named Atlee. Uh, who's also my designer at Collab, uh, very excellent designer, um, among among a number of other partners like Hype Shop for live streaming uh, and a few others. And every 30 days, uh, Malta, uh, Madison, and I get together and we debate who we want the, uh, the uh, artist and what the object might be for that month. And um, the story that we tell is one of accessibility. It's one of um, understanding. And it's one that's meant to highlight the amazing groundbreaking bleeding edge work that's being done in our space that we think will be interesting culturally and historically over time. And so we have told stories every 30 days around artists like X copy and Claire silver and Larva labs. And most recently, um, it's, it was snow uh, and the chromie squiggle. Um, and so that's just the quick context on every 30 days. And, um, you know, I'm, um, Madison and I are, have long talked about charged objects and this idea of what it means to feel connected to an event or an experience through some sort of object itself. And, um, digital posters is one of those objects that we've decided to lean into. And so every month that paired with the exhibition is a thousand, uh, digital posters that are priced, uh, very attractively. It's usually around $20, um, and they act as the, the marker or the symbol for, for that month's exhibition. Uh, and so as time goes on, uh, people can have a, a collection of all of the great work that, um, that we're showing and exhibiting every 30 days at the gallery. Big fan of Glitch and the posters. And, and coincidentally, the fourth poster was about Larva Labs with Snowfrost Punk. Yes. With Snowfrost Zombie. And the fifth is about the Chromie Squiggle. So I'm loving the posters. Thank uh, you. Talking about the Snowfro, what quality or what made you uh, think that he's some someone special and, and someone worth following? Yeah, I mean, where to start with that guy? Because uh, the, the truth is, is like he has so many amazing qualities. Um, I would say the most important, um, I would say there's two. Uh, I would say the, the thing that uh, like I think brings people in is vision. Uh, I think Eric Snowfro is so crystallized and so crystal clear on how this technology can be used and how interesting innovations and products can be built on top of it and how art can progress and be furthered, not just for himself, but for others that that vision, uh, is actually like incredibly, it's like totally attractive to the people that come into the space, right? It's like, here is somebody who understands where the puck is going in many ways and has the technical understanding and the vision by which to build towards that and um, push the space forward time and time again, that it is like incredibly um, intoxicating to, to have somebody like that in our industry that we can look to, right? There's not very many people like Snowfro who have, uh, who have that vision of where things are going and the, the ability and the execution by which to over time hit milestone after milestone after milestone, pushing this space forward in, I think, what we all could collectively agree are the right directions. I think the second quality 
that Eric has is just like his, um, like his kindness. And like, I don't know if there's a better word. It really is a, a pure embodiment of like everything that I find special about humanity and, um, community and the generosity that you see between people. And the combination of like vision and kindness is unmatched as you look across, uh, this space. I mean, uh, for better or for worse, like economics are often why most people come into this space, but there is a pure, there's like a pureness uh, around Eric's, uh, vision and curiosity that I think permeates that pretty strongly. It, you can see that, you know, of around the types of people that collect his work and the chromic squiggle or the types of people that have been brought into on-chain generative art or the types of events that, uh, you know, the art blocks ink in like, uh, kind of, uh, brings together, right. There is something, uh, very special and kind and, uh, just, you know, human that I think, um, just is a derivative of Eric's qualities as a person that is, uh, has always been very special. Derek, I don't think it's a secret. You've been close to Snowfro for some time. You've helped advise him along the way. I mean, Eric has impacted a number of different people's lives in so many different ways. I guess at the end of the day, what does Snowfro mean to the digital space? And what do you think his legacy will be? Yeah, it's a really, uh, it's a really great question. I don't think there's going to be Listen, I think, uh, unquestionably like the, to me, right. Like, I think you may find other opinions elsewhere, but to me, like the chromie squiggle is going to be a huge part of his legacy. It is a, a very important symbol. It's a mark that I think, um, it, the ability to interpret that mark expands in lots of different directions. It's inclusive, it's friendly, it's positive. Uh, it's, you know, immutable, it's on chain. It has few external dependencies, uh, it is itself a symbolic historic piece of art. It is, you know, a piece of culture. So in many ways, I think, um, you know, part of my answer really does involve like this amazing gift he brought to the world, which was like this project Chromie Squiggle and everything it stands for and what it's meant to people and how it's inspired technologically the space to unfold. But I also just knowing Eric know that, um, you know, he, he would never just, uh, like stop there. Like I think his ambitions to uh, affect change are so positive and vast that um, my view is like he has a tremendous amount of work and vision and projects that he wants to bring out to the world. And, you know, all of them will be filtered through the lens that is Snowfro for sure, which I think, you know, brings attention and awareness to his full body of work. Um, but my, my view is, uh, he is a lifelong tinkerer. He is a lifelong, um, you know, artist and creative who loves playing at the bleeding edge. And, uh, over time, my view is that he will continue to push forward in those directions. Um, and, and those directions may expand into sub directions as time goes on. Really looking forward to that future. I, I, I agree with the tinkerer about the Snowflow. I'm still impressed how he tested all the Ethereum apps so early in the Ethereum history. That's impressive. Something that we love to ask to our guests is which word would you use to describe Snowflow? Hmm. Man, that is so hard. Um, gosh. You know, I love the word tinkerer for him. He used it um, in the metadata for um, when he launched Chromie Squiggle. And I think he he both self-identified. I mean, what a, a tinkerer is, what is a tinkerer? It's, you know, someone who plays with technology, who um, imbues technology with their own personal touch, not necessarily for, you know, economic reasons, but for the purity of how technology works and evolves and how things work underneath. And, um, I think that word also embodies his, his like very important qualities of, of curiosity and kindness and sharing. And, um, there's just a, I think a purity to the word tinkerer that really makes for whatever reason, I always just come back to that word with Eric. Uh, he's just a, uh, an incredible artist and an incredible tinkerer. 
Derek, you've been supportive of the Chrome Reese Google writing about its historical significance and mentioning it uh, an uncountable number of times on 100 proof. It seems that like the squiggles are always top of mind for you, so much so that one of my favorite memories with a squiggle has to do with you in the Beeple event at Proof. And I remember it coming into existence on the, the piece titled uh, every, uh, Group Effort as part of his everyday series because we just kept screaming squiggle at him. No, it's stuff. It, I mean, it's definitely correct. Uh, like I confirmed, uh, when I walked up to people and let him know to throw a chromy squiggle in there, and uh, he ended up throwing one in there, which was awesome. So, so you you clearly have passion here. What has been your journey with this chromy squiggle, and and like why so much conviction? Yeah, I mean, like the embedded qualities of Snowfro, uh, who he is as an artist. Uh, the collection itself, what it stands for from a te technology perspective, um, a historical innovation perspective, a cultural perspective, the granularity and the thoughtfulness that went into building the project that frankly can only take years, right? Like it was so clear when you started really investigating this project that this had been something that he had been optimizing and thinking deeply about for years. And Frankly, the bar was set so high with this project that uh, it was just it. Once I just started digging in, it was like I couldn't look back. It was just like I got to go further and further and further, and continue to investigate as many of these details as possible because this person has spent so much time and energy, not just crafting something so um, technologically innovative on the contract side, but also brilliant a brilliant use of it as a test case that um it was just like so deeply exciting to see somebody put that much work and effort into a single you know body of work um so i would say you know the thing that got me very excited in november and december of 2020 when the project first launched was just the attention to detail and the thoughtfulness around what he had done um which then as time went on and you know he would spend time chatting through his design decisions, both inside CryptoPunks and inside the ArtBlocks Discord. And I was watching how he treated artists that were coming in and asking questions. And I watched how he was treating collectors as they asked questions. And I saw how his brain worked and how he thought and that level of kindness to people and the folks that were coming into the space. It was just so hard not to root for this guy and like this project and everything that it stood for. And further, like I wanted to do more to kind of support this vision bearing out. It was very inspiring just for me uh, to see someone like this and a project like this um, kind of converge together into something that I thought were very interesting ingredients. Um, so I, would, I don't know if I'm totally asking your, your, your answering your question there, Jared, but those are just a couple of the things that got me excited early on. And uh, I also love when you start digging deep, you also understand the couple two plus years of work that the Snowflow put in it's it's obvious once you start digging in the, yes in the project totally yeah. and and to that to that point it's obvious it's so obvious once you start digging in but I also think this is part of the brilliance of the project which is you can enjoy this project to whatever ever degree you want right like uh, out of the gates it is so easy and under to understand what's going on here and we talked Malta and I talked about this in the piece uh, I mean, like a computer generated rainbow line, right? Like that's what you're confronted with. It like, it really, you know, presents like these fundamental questions, like right out of the gates. It's like, what is art? Why is this valuable? What is going on here? Like, and you see this often with like the initial response, which is like, it's really cool, but like my kid could have done that. And the further you go into the project, you realize more and more that you're really going down the rabbit hole and um, these very aesthetic choices are really just veneers for this incredibly rich, detailed, complex um, algorithm and collection that he spent years painstakingly crafting and optimizing. It, it's something that you are going to see once and immediately recognize the second time you see it. You can be a couple of days researching the project or a couple of years and still discovering, yes. as the three of us are, and still discovering new features, new traits, new interesting things. Yeah. So it, yeah. 
thankfully we have you nifty to help us uh, get there a little faster <laughs> <laughs> so we are three big fans of squiggles is there a bear case where squiggles don't reach that god level that we are expecting them to reach I think, uh, you know, life is uh, not about certainties. Life is about probabilities. So there, I would, of course, assign some probability that um, that, that outcome could exist. My, my view is, um, well, I guess, like, the first thing I'll say is, like, that's totally okay with me. Um, if, like, you know, what this project stands for is uh, an early, brilliant test case to demonstrate what would, you know, um, what would later move to something else. Um, and it's only appreciated by diehard crypto art nerds. Like, I think that that's a win. Um, I think, uh, I would be happy with that outcome. Um, my view though, is the project and what it stands for and the design decisions and the, the emerging collectors that continue to come around and understand its importance and its significance that's only going to continue to grow. And so it's difficult for me to assign anything but a low probability that this thing just becomes a relic for crypto art nerds to continue to talk about with each other 20 years from now. Derek, your article for Collab Currency on the Medium is, is titled Storing Value in Digital Objects is one of the most amazing articles I think has been written in the digital space. Uh, I believe it's pinned to your Twitter. It's something that's absolutely a must read in this space. Uh, I actually read it probably three times. It's a 20 minute read, you know, full disclosure. It, it's not for the faint of heart, but it is just packed full of amazing, amazing information. And I think it helps solidify you as one of the thought leaders in this space. But in that article, uh, one of the things that you referenced most was about the inclusion of uh, the Lindy effect and its uh, effects on digital art and storage of value and historic storage of value. Can you briefly introduce what is the Lindy effect and how do you believe it applies to the Chroma Squiggle? Yeah. So uh, Lindy is just a, uh, it's a theory that if an object has proven to be a reliable object or a reliable store value over a long period of time, it is likely to continue to do so over a similar time in the future. It's uh, directly related to its future life expectancy, and it's typically evaluated through non-perishables. Um, and often, frankly, it's it's used as a, a mental model to understand things like gold, which you know historically has been an object, non-perishable, that has been used to store value across many, 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 many lifetimes. Uh, and the, the fundamental question that Lindy tries to investigate is like, why is that happening? So, um, you know, I think an, another way to think about this is, I don't know if you if um, you know, folks who are deep in finance have heard this idea of like liquidity begets liquidity. Um, and there's like concepts around, I think, shelling points and, um, that are acts as like instructive mental models to think about these concepts. Um, but the, the idea is really just that, you know, once uh, an object has reached escape velocity and mental models of markets have formed around them, it's likely that those markets will continue to persist um, for as long as, you know, these things have, um, have been evaluated under that lens. And so, you know, we, we, I just like to take a step back, the way we think about real estate or the way we think about fine art or the way we think about, you know, storing value in a Van Gogh or storing value in gold or storing value in a very rare collectible, um, you know, these things are very charged with attention. They're very networked and they're understood to serve a very specific role by markets who over time continue to perpetuate and fall back into those roles of support as time persists. And so I think the question is, can objects that are digital in nature start to embody some of the qualities that objects that are Lindy, that are physical, have embodied over the course of history? And my view is with blockchains that are by their very nature, just a trust-minimized ledger. It's a shared computer database. 
and the ERC-721 and other standards, which essentially act as um, these formats by which to establish an object's um, uh, scarcity. With those two things kind of converging together, you can now unlock property rights, just like physical objects have. Scarcity plus trust minimized ledger, those two things coming together allow us to start building property rights on top of digital objects, just like we've had for physical objects over the course of human history. And once you have property rights established for specific digital objects, that's when you can start to have markets forming around them that then provide indicators of things like Lindy uh, that can be attributed to them over time uh, as markets continue to perpetuate these roles that I described. So that's how I think about um, digital art, m maybe one day, you know, or digital objects of any kind, maybe one day exhibiting some of the, these same Lindy factors that store value objects that are physical have, exem has, have exhibited over the course of human history. Love that article. Uh, recommending it to everyone as well, storing value in digital ob objects. And one thing that you were touching a little bit is that you opened that article talking about the that in the age of information abundance, most value can be tra traced back to some form of attention generating event. Yeah. Can you expand on the concept of attention as a valuable resource and how has it it has evolved in the digital age? Yeah, so I'll, I'll riff on this um, and feel free to just like pause me at any point. But mm -hmm. I think the, the arguments that I, was, that I was really trying to, um, I guess like to, to like zoom out for a minute, the, the point of that piece was really to establish two ideas. One, that digital objects could be networked much like physical objects and uh, attention is the predicate towards like networking happening. And then the second concept was that digital objects could exhibit one of two qualities, depending on how it was being optimized, either a store value quality and certain prongs would need to get hit or a product and service quality where certain prongs would need to get hit. Now for purposes of like the squiggle and on-chain generative art, my view is that certain things will definitely trip that networking effect that can happen uh, that we see with the top three largest companies in the world, you know, Microsoft, uh, Google, um, and Apple. Um, and we also see around, you know, uh, celebrity, uh, right? So like Mr. Beast being able to command all sorts of products uh, and generate so much revenue just by virtue of him having an audience of 125 million people that follow his channel. Or, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger running for governor of California and being able to win. Or Donald Trump, a celebrity, being able to enter politics very quickly and ascend. I mean, we see networking and its effects on outcomes constantly. And uh, I'll answer your question there in a moment. Um, but then, uh, then, you know, for this last prong, which is like the attention economy plus products and services, this is where I spend most of my time with cloud currency. It's not on the store value objects. It's on how can businesses and platforms get created by which to create digital products and digital services using crypto and blockchains to enable, you know, tens of millions of people to enter our space over the next few years. Um, so that's for another conversation. We, uh, we, can, we can pick that up uh, at a later time. But to get back to the actual question you're asking, I did lead off the paper talking about this idea of like the attention economy and networking that can happen. And the concept, the really like, I guess, core atomic unit that I was really trying to convey was, if you look at any object that is sufficiently valued, if you look at any um, celebrity or politician or um, movie or uh, business or platform or sellable good, the reason why value connotes to that thing terminally is because it started with some attention generating event that was able to provide value flows to that product or service or object or company or celebrity or whatever it may be. And positioned correctly, the same thing could happen with digital objects. Uh, and so networking is a very big thing that I think about when I think about how value accrues to our space. It's really like the lifeblood of all, of all value. It's the reason why X copy one of ones still sell for hundreds of ETH. It's the reason why Chromey squiggles continue to do incredibly well. Uh, and, and, you know, have this tight price band, even during like a very prolific bear market. It's why 
people are still buying CryptoPunks for 50 ETH every time I log on to Twitter. Um, it's why Beeple continues to be a universally, um, you know, beloved artist and whose work continues to sell for millions of dollars. Um, it's You can trace back these value accretion events to networks that are being formed. And uh, it was really important for me to establish that idea before talking about stores of value or products and services or any of this stuff, because it's really like the core atomic unit for how value begins. Totally, totally agree. And I think it's a very nice way to simplify and summarize the complex way of understanding yeah. how, how to trace value. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. We have a, some rapid fire questions. As we always say, question is rapid fire. The answer doesn't need okay. to be. <laughs> First one, any squiggle or any grail that got away and oh. the story behind it? Yes. So um, this is a tricky one because like I would say in this idea of like the full set, the full Chrome squiggle set, which it, which would constitute like the six base normal squiggles and the six hypers, there was probably about five or six of us that were actually trying to accomplish that goal uh, early on. Uh, this was back when I think squiggles were all underneath and hypers were very rarely traded, but they were. Um, and what I think most of us quickly realized is some of us had pieces that we didn't want to give up and the only way we could make trades happen is if we did give them up. And so there would be complex conversations where three or four of us would try to do some jujitsu trade around these things. And it was just so clear that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, there was one point where Snowfro offered to trade me one of his zombies for a hyper that he needed. Um, and I did not do that trade, uh, which what I think set in motion, maybe one or two people being able to complete the full set. Um, but as it were, you know, time went on and none of these trades were able to happen. And it, what ended up happening was like nobody has completed this full set. And I don't know if anybody ever will, frankly. Um, I think it might be too tricky to pull off at this point. Um, I don't want to say never because I know somebody out there might be listening and um, can figure out how to put this one, pull this one off. But my view is it's going to be very difficult to pull this this uh, this trick off at some point, and it's definitely a regret I have not trying to make it work. Yeah, that hyperset is something that I absolutely would love to collect around. I think it's uh, you know you have the Achilles heel of the hyper pipe. It, it's almost impossible to get there, but it's definitely definitely um, something that people will strive for. And, and you know, quite honestly, it's a personal goal of mine for the fund is to to collect all six hypers. It's it's a crazy goal, but you know somebody's got to do it. With only seven hyperbolts and four hyperpipes, it's yeah, yeah, challenging. It's tricky. What pieces are we see a Fidenza, a full set like six types plus the hyper, if I'm not mistaken, on your yeah. wall, a rocket, Tom Sachs rocket. What other pieces are hanging on your walls? Gosh. NFTs or non NFTs? Yeah, we have um, we have quite a bit of art in our house. Just some off the top of my head. We have a a very large Marfa Yuka by. DCA. Um, we have uh, some. We have a number of squiggles, uh, both hand drawn and digital. Um, there's a, a very famous artist um, that uh, my family is close to called Norman Seif, uh, the famous um, Steve Jobs uh, photo where he's holding the laptop, and a number of other, um, uh, just like you know the there's a number of uh, like famous uh, photographs from from the 80s and, and early 90s that Norman was behind and uh, so we have a bunch of Norman stuff um, in the house we've got um, I mean there's just, there's a lot of generative art so like uh, a lot of art box pieces um, and it feels like there's just more and more uh, popping in uh, almost every week at this point nice mm. My final rapid fire question, and then it's all Jared, is you have had tremendous success in your career. What motivates you to, to keep going, to continue? Well, th first of all, thank you. Um, I appreciate you saying that. I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not necessarily like driven by uh, like that or like success. Um, I am, very, I feel very blessed that I get to do what I love, which is really like, um, explore and help create an industry that I really feel uh, impassioned about. Um, my, you know, my, I've mentioned this before 
uh, to, to you both and, and previously on, on podcasts, but, um, like my view is like all value flows end up on blockchains and it's not a matter of like, uh, if it's a matter of just like on what time frame, And, uh, I believe in this technology so much. I believe in what it can do to incentivize groups of humans to coordinate, to create a better world. I believe what it can do to shine transparency in places that have been traditionally opaque. I believe in its ability to provide property rights digitally for things, um, that frankly have, have never existed, but then also that I think will empower, you know, massive amounts of, of humans around the world to leapfrog into building wealth and storing wealth in a way that's just not possible given how structurally this, the world has evolved. Um, so I just, I believe in the merits of this technology and I believe in what it can unlock for uh, a number of different segments that interact with it over time. And I feel very blessed that, you know, myself and my business partner get to spend all of our time thinking about how to best accelerate that vision and find great founders who are working on big problems to help get us, get us there. Uh, so I think that's probably the thing that motivates me the most. Um, yeah, I, I we'll leave it there. I would say that's probably the thing that, uh, from a professional perspective. Yeah. Derek, you've had a, a tremendous amount of success over your career as you outlined, uh, up front, but how do you define success today and has this changed at all over time? Um, I'm sure it has. I would say success to me is being able to spend time with my wife and um, hang out and chat about the things that we find interesting and um, and you know have a successful successful friendships, a successful relationship, um, be a good uh, sibling to my brothers, and uh, those are those are kind of the things that like I'm. Uh, would say like I want to most optimize for as time goes on. So Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm always amazed at how insightful you are, how you're able to look around the corners and just what sort of next level thinking you're doing for the space uh, and how you're advocating for it. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to, to share with the listenership? Man, the only thing I can say is that uh, you guys continue to impress myself uh, and others in our community around all the work you guys are doing. Um, I, I can say, you know, you got uh, a couple of the Squiggle Dow folks came and chatted with Flamingo Dow just to give updates a couple of weeks ago. And I think all of us in there were left very impressed with the thoughtfulness, the attention to detail, the the kindness, the strategy that you guys are employing over there and uh, just want to find ways to continue to support your mission and um, help out where we can because we're all very excited about what you guys are doing. Thank you so much, Derek. For anybody who wants to follow Derek, please feel free to follow him on Twitter. He can be followed at Derek EDWS on Twitter and Collab Currency on Medium. Amazing articles, amazing content on both fronts, doing amazing things. I also want to recommend please follow SquiggleDow, like and repost this uh, for any content that you found valuable. Join the Squiggle Dow uh, in Discord. There is a public section that's open to anybody. There's also a token gated section for NFT or Squiggle holders. Please like or leave us a comment and feel free to DM us. We're always, always looking to improve in uh, the content in any way. And we're always open uh, to, to any feedback you do have. So please, we want to hear from you. Uh, make sure to blow this up for Derek been an amazing guest, been doing amazing uh, work for the space. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for the insightful commentary, for the insightful responses. It's been an absolute pleasure. So on behalf of the Squiggle Dow, Nifty, myself, and everyone involved with this, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and thank you for all that you do for the space. Uh, it does not go unnoticed. You're doing really amazing work. So thank you, Derek. I appreciate that. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity and uh, I'll see you guys in Marfa. See you in Marfa. Thank you so much. Awesome. The information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only. It should not be considered as professional or financial advice. The hosts and guests are not licensed financial advisors, accountants, or lawyers. The content is based on personal experiences, opinions, and research, and its accuracy, completeness, and timeliness cannot be guaranteed.